Hey all, so I had a few people mention that the Cinemasker podcast was out and there was some helpful information in there. I wasn't going to watch it originally, but Underwater Levels and Rockin' Cat Reviews, thanks guys, you gave me a few little shoves or tidbits that made me want to watch it. So overall, it was a pretty helpful video. It went into the background of some things and persistent questions that longtime fans have of Cinemassacre. One of the things to start out at 1 minute and 52 seconds approximately, Karen I rolled about the virtual filming that, and Justin kind of shifted in his chair, so you can kind of see that that's a sensitive subject. James was pushing a virtual environment for quite a while and having gotten COVID myself I understand that it's an issue and it's I'm taking it very seriously and I get people want to take it seriously but when it comes to filming you know have a uh, Mando vaccination rule or have six feet or just do something right so that was a little bit of a, a tense subject you can kind of tell so you can kind of read the body language which really helps and that's a really important element when it comes to podcasts so body language was pretty persistent in this entire um, stream. So for example, James would light up when he talked about his band, when he talked about Rex Viper. So you can tell that's where his focus is. As a longtime fan, I could care less about Rex Viper. I couldn't care less about Rex Viper, to be frank. I know a lot of other people feel that way. You know, some people have told me that they really think it's a good, cool idea and they're on board with it. I'm really not. And you can kind of see from the views. And uh, Underwater Levels has really pushed this out. Um, and uh, he's been tracking it, and it's really interesting um, to kind of see how a non-starter that is. But if it's something that he really enjoys, James, you know, and he's 41 this year, I guess for health benefits, maybe he should do that. But it really does seem like it's taking up all of his time, and it's just not profitable. Also, a few notes. Kyle and Bootsy weren't listed in the podcast stamp the sound stamp outline that's listed in the description of the video. However, they are mentioned, and I'm going to get into that. Um, they were discussed uh, briefly, very briefly, toward the end of the video, and frankly, it was a little bit less than I'd liked, but it did cover some questions that I had. There's also some free marketing that James put out there for himself for his new AVGN toy that's in the background, if you didn't notice. Um, you'll see it now that I mentioned it. Um, and I also noticed Justin's shirt. Did the same designer design Mike Matai's live logo um, to design the shirt? That's just something I had to talk about. Because um, I was uh, curious. I kind of do like uh, Mike's live stream logo, and it, it looked doggone like the same thing. So that was kind of an interesting thing that I noticed while watching the video. Um, also, one of my pet peeves from this podcast, Screenwave is again kind of injecting personal anecdotes that nobody really wants to hear about. So Kieran talks about his white claws at minute 1926, and then he talks about weight loss at 20, uh, 20 minutes. And Justin kind of started this on the... Uh, on Reddit and it just kind of persisted and this isn't really something that I'm interested in hearing about weight loss. I know it's good to lose weight, but it just doesn't have anything to do with James. It's not really interesting to me at all. I'm sure there are other people that emulate that sentiment as well. Overall, there was a chance to actually hear James talk because Tony wasn't on the show. So usually when Tony takes a break and joins, he just overtakes the conversation. So that was kind of nice. Um, minute 21 and a half, Rex Viper is listed by James as the most fun side project ever. At least it's a side project and not the main focus. But it's unfortunate as this seems to be the only area James really gets excited, like I said earlier. I'm actually with Mike on this. I don't really care about Rex Viper, as I said. So that's definitely something that James needs to work out and do, and hopefully eventually it goes away. But that's just my thoughts on it. Uh, minute 27.48... Clearly, Screenwave isn't a fan of the band. Justin doesn't even play instruments, and he's the channel manager. So that kind of shows you that he's not really... He's a, probably at least leery of it. And I'm sure Ryan emulates that sentiment as well. Um, 2808. Kyle is mentioned as the originally helping James with music. Predominantly singing. And James said at the time he, didn't, he wasn't able to get it. So 
all this time later, his focus is, you know, guitar and just the music uh, development and the process, but he doesn't sing, they have a vocalist. Uh, but it was interesting because Kyle is mentioned um, a few times in the video, and I'll get into more later. So, 37, minute 37, 36, um, Screenwave pushes their self-promotion like usual. That's a little bit unfortunate, but I've gotten used to them doing that. Um, minute 38 and a half, James is doing green screen work and sunk 100 hours into one of their Rex Viper projects. So, my thoughts on this... He probably should let Screenwave do that, and uh, green screen work is, I don't know, for somebody who owns a channel, I would think that would be more of a um, channel management focus, because it, it, more of a MCM focus. If they're editing his videos already and writing the scripts, he really should be putting that work to them, because that, that seems a little bit below his level. He should be focusing on the wide spectrum. Um, decision making and leadership, but maybe he doesn't like doing that. I don't know. Maybe he still likes to get into the weeds. It clearly seems that way. Uh, minute 39, James, you know, again, is very involved with Minutia. It's good for him to work at a higher level, like I said, um, and make top tier channel show decisions only. Um, there's a question at one, a minute, at one hour, two minutes and 39 seconds from Strange Vision. 255, which is uh, from Reddit. So it's about Bootsy and Kyle. And basically it says these people were on the channel and we want to know what happened to them. And that's a question that's been echoed throughout Reddit for years. So James kind of jumps and says nothing happened to them. He's clearly a little bit pissed about the subject. Um, but then he goes into more detail, which I appreciated because, you know, this is some of the backdoor stuff you don't hear about. James reached out to Kyle about a Spider-Man part in the Vegas video that they did. Um, the fear and loathing, I think, is what, what he was talking about. Um, so he said Kyle helped him. They were very good friends in college, and I believe they were roommates at one point. Get his first job, indirectly meet his wife, and yada yada. So Kyle, he's saying, is a great, great friend. I think he's talking historically because going forward, it doesn't really seem like they're great, great friends, unfortunately. So my question, why was Kyle made one of the back office Greenwave consultants as late as the Keith Apricary episode back in Christmas 2016? That was the release date of that. Why didn't he have more of a hand there? We may never find out at this point. You know, this subject may be closed because James talked about it and he probably doesn't want to bring it up anymore. I mean, he, it, he was saying, uh, Rock and Cat Reviews pointed this out. He was using a lot of conversation filler. So me, I tend to say, um, uh, you know, to fill up a thought when I'm talking, especially if there's no script. James says like. He said like a ton of times and he kind of looked at the table and, and whatnot. So not much is said about Bootsy other than he likes ACDC and baseball. Last time James had any contact was a few years ago based on the podcast. So it really is kind of a sad situation um, there, and, and I'll go into that a little bit more. One hour and four minutes in, uh, Mike is most likely the one you'll see around. They talk about how he doesn't do much on YouTube and streams all the time, but it seems like, you know, at least that door's open. So we're going to, you know, possibly see Mike later, and he's already invited Justin onto the stream and whatnot. So same minute. Um, one hour, four minutes, going to one hour, five minutes, there's clearly bad blood with Bootsy. Nobody really knows or keeps tabs on him. Justin mentioned that he's doing his own streaming stuff. He thinks, now, musically, not, like, gameplays. He does some gameplays with the Attic Dwellers, but it's very, very intermittent. Same with Kyle. He has a ton of kids, family stuff. They think of business construction stuff. So Justin says he thinks, he thinks, he thinks when it comes to Kyle and Bootsy. So that really tells me that he, they don't really know much more than what people are speculating on Reddit, which is upsetting. And um, James, as I think I mentioned, actually called Kyle and couldn't get a hold of him. So that's unfortunate. So Kyle doesn't feel compelled to pick up his phone. And part of me wants to take James' side on this because... I had a longtime friend that I was best friends with in college, and he just one day just ghosted me. And, uh, you know, he ghosted a lot of other people too. I um, found that out from my group of friends, but it was, uh, it hurt, you know? Um, so maybe Kyle's of the type where he just leaves his past in the past. But 
either way, it seems like there's clearly some bad blood there, and they're definitely not going to... The door has been closed on them coming into the show at a later point, and Justin made that very clear. At uh, one hour and five minutes, they mentioned Kevin Finn, so he's basically the glitch gremlin. The head incident sequel, um, Kevin seems like he has different objectives in life, but there isn't really necessarily bad blood between him and James. And there's also two Kevins. There's Kevin Finn, and then there's the Kevin that acted in the original Head, which was Head Incident, which came out in, like, 1999. Over it sound, overall, it sounds like James is pretty bad at staying in touch with people, and depending on the person that he uh, parts with, that can rub some people the wrong way. You know, they feel neglected, I guess. He smiled when he talked about the two Kevins that worked with him on the Head Saga. The original actor's name is Kevin, and apparently nothing on Cinemassacre is really enticing him to come back, at least. But James got him as an extra in The Head Returns, but it was cell phone footage, and it was basically, they weren't even in the same area, and James had to text him, and it was just a, a last-ditch effort to get him in the film, which is a little sad, but, you know, you figure life kind of goes one way, and, and also he said that this particular Kevin, I didn't catch the last name, didn't work in film, didn't have camera and recording equipment, and basically had some other career, so he didn't, you know, obviously didn't have much of a YouTube presence at all, and he probably doesn't really care because he's not getting paid, but either way, you know, he did it for James as a friend. But going further, talking about James, Kieran is still apparently a big James Raw fan. You can see throughout the video, he kind of gushes toward James uh, several times, which is interesting. I mean... Good for him. I know he was an AVGN fan back when he was in college, and now he works for the show, so that's like pretty huge for him. Um, one hour and seven minutes in, more info comes out about where James sourced his original games in the AVGN trilogy, in the earlier episodes at least. People have been saying for years that it was his original NES collection, and actually that's kind of what he said in his earlier videos as well, and also what Mike gave him. Now James specified here that his old neighbor was passing him stuff to review, and you can actually see um, the name, the handwriting is really bad, on some of the games. Now, that's an interesting tidbit. James eventually inherited a ton of passed down games. I've been a benefactor of this with my brother, and um, thanks, bro. And it's awesome, to say the least, to get all this collectible stuff at no cost. For somebody with very little initial budget, it's a cool piece of nerd history, because, you know, back in the day, James basically worked at his editing job, and then he would go home, and he'd work on the AVGM videos, and he didn't really have much else of a life going on other than his friends and uh, eventually April, which led to, you know, the rest of his history. But overall, what did I think of the podcast? I, I didn't hate it. Um, I had to skip through it. I'm not a big Screenwave fan, as most of you know. I am i don't, I, you know, I, I like to give James a hard time. Um, I think he's made more than several missteps. Uh, if I had a big channel, I'd do things very, very differently, but the simple fact of the matter is I don't have a big channel, and I, it's all hearsay, it's all speculation, and it's really hard for me to cast stones when I'm not in the same position, but I, I do think that some of this information was that they put out was tough talking subjects. Like I said before, they didn't put timestamps for their discussions on Bootsy and Kyle, so you know they don't really want to market that stuff. But they did bring it up, and to me it's pretty clear that we're not going to be seeing either of them again. And I already knew that. I already kind of put two and two together. But to hear it from the horse's mouth is, is helpful. The stage that ScreenWave put together, I think ScreenWave has very good capability with editing. Um, their intro image was, their intro animation was good. You know, they have the 3D. Um, development capability, they've got the post-editing capability, um, they're also pretty commanding with their set development. I thought the room looked professional, it looked pretty cool, kind of like a podcast, maybe even like a Joe Rogan podcast, uh, maybe even better in some ways. But it's still a lot of screen wave talking and talking about themselves and just, I don't, as a longtime fan, I don't want to hear that. I want to just hear James talk. But then again, he's got a dialogue with somebody and all of his original friends are either not involved or they're gone. And this this podcast made that very clear. So in a way, it's a little sad, but it is eye-opening. And um, overall, I'm glad I watched it. Will I keep watching these podcasts? I don't know. Um, I might skim through them as they come out. I guess they're doing them pretty frequently. So anyway, 
wanted to share that. This is the high level view there of the ScreenWave uh, podcast series that they just released. And thanks for listening. Feel free to like, share, and subscribe and more to come.